a lot is made of so-called non-violence or non-violent struggle or non-violent protest. This video isn't about the flaws of strictly non-violent tactics, so I'll put some links to books about that in the description. This video is for people who believe in non-violence or peace and would automatically disqualify any protest or movement that doesn't adhere to a code of non-violence. Like everything I talk about on this channel, the belief in non-violence as the only legitimate form of struggle is a product of propaganda. And it's such powerful propaganda, it blinds us to most forms of violence. Our society in its current form is the product of violence, and that violence isn't over. We perpetuate it every day. Do you think your actions don't contribute to violence just because you're not the one holding the gun? Well, let's see. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. Let's start with land. I don't know about you, but I grew up on conquered land that used to belong to people whose descendants are still alive. Their ancestors were killed by disease and war, their land was stolen, and their culture was destroyed. A new system, a colonial system, extremely violent toward natives, took their place. The system brought with it new norms of property, that land would be bought and sold in a new currency. In other words, it was commodified, transformed from a place to live and grow food into a market. The natives were relegated to small parcels of land away from the centers of commerce and policed by the colonial state. If you don't think about history, it's easy to think property is not a product of violence. But like all markets, creating a market for land required wrenching something away from other people and forcing them to either pay for it or go without. The exclusive claim to land that property norms assume is defended by violence. If you have a little place of your own, great, you're not taking up more space than you need. But some people have large houses with large gardens, and because they own it, they're denying other people access to that land. There are people without homes who could use a spare room in a large house, or build a small place of their own in a backyard. But they're not allowed. They're kept out by force. That's because property is the law. The supreme law, in fact. So the police will come round and point guns at people who violate it. Or that land could be used to feed people. But instead, native plants are killed off to make way for grass, which is maintained by huge amounts of water, along with gasoline to power the lawnmower, and chemicals that can taint the water supply. It's bad enough to settle land that's someone else's and use guns to make it your own, but then they make it impossible to grow anything on the land other than a field they will never use for anything. They're willing to poison the earth for this status symbol, just like they tear up the earth to look good in gold and diamonds. If you think destroying the ground isn't violence, try growing food without it. Most suburbs are food deserts, thanks to lawns. But if you're like most of us, you've outsourced the growing of food to large-scale farmers. Instead of using my precious land for something useful, I'll ask someone else to expand the amount of land necessary to feed people, killing trees and wildlife in the process, and decreasing the amount of land where nature can just be left alone. Feeding people in huge markets like North America is so lucrative that large swaths of forest, including the Amazon, are cleared to make room for cattle grazing and soy plantations. Now, as vegans can tell you, eating beef is violence. But what a lot of them fail to realize is if your soy comes from reclaimed Amazon jungle or colonized American farmland, it's violence too. 
The Amazon and other forests are home to a million species, including humans. And the rest of us need them to breathe. But it's going, just like nature all around the world, because capitalism doesn't value nature until it's consumed. And it doesn't recognize limits. We cannot solve our environmental problems under such a system. These property norms and the rest of this European way of life transplanted into North America are violence that I perpetuated and benefited from every day of my life as a kid. And they wouldn't have been possible without colonialism. I've barely scratched the surface of everything violent about colonialism, but along with stealing land from people and turning it to shit, colonialism ensured I lived in a segregated neighborhood, had more money and better job prospects, got better health care, and had better leisure facilities than people who just couldn't afford to live there. I got those things because, as a white guy with well-off parents, colonialism denied those things to people who didn't look like me. And it denied me the chance to learn about any of that until I was older. Again, it all looks legitimate because it's the law. But the law means different standards for different people. If you live in a lily-white neighborhood full of lawns, you might hardly ever see the police. If you live somewhere else, you might see them every day, looking for a chance to arrest someone. The colonial system kills people every day, whether directly through police murders or indirectly through poor access to health care and medicine or unclean drinking water or just lack of money to buy healthy food. The thing about money is you're only allowed to have shelter or food if you have it. And you're only allowed to have it if someone gives it to you. Historically, to have lots of money meant you had lots of land which was granted to you by some governing authority, i.e. it was taken from the locals by force. We see it over and over again in history, in every country colonized by Europeans, but even before that in the Enclosure Acts in England. They used laws and taxes to force locals into wage labor, ensuring the rich would get richer and the poor would stay poor. Those systems still exist. It's just that now the state legitimizes itself by allocating a small portion of what is stolen from your labor to hospitals and schools and roads. We're instructed to believe the only way to have hospitals and schools and roads is if the state builds them, because we civilians couldn't possibly figure it out for ourselves. We perpetuate this same violence when we buy iPhones and other electronics. The capitalist economic model has spread all around the world, so while we sleep, land is destroyed for natural resources, and people are enslaved to mine them. They may or may not be outright slaves, forced to stay where they are, or they might just be slaves in the sense they have no money but are forced to pay for everything in money, so they have to take these jobs to survive. You could say we benefit from this violence because of phones and computers and so on, and I would, because it's about recognizing how systems benefit some and hurt others. But the real beneficiaries are the owners of these corporations. How many people need to work like slaves their whole lives so a few people can get rich? Some of these slaves are prisoners. Tens of thousands of inmates in government-run U.S. prisons make goods that people consume every day. You might eat food picked or processed by prisoners. You might wear clothes made by prisoners. You might be supporting prison labor when you call a call center or buy all kinds of manufactured goods. I know you don't mean to. You don't know you're doing it. But as long as it's possible to profit off prison labor, it will continue. There's a financial incentive to lock up more people, just like there's a financial incentive to go to war because of how much war contractors make, and financial incentives to keep drugs illegal because of how many people profit from that. That said, a state might have its own reasons to do all those things, lock people up, go to war, criminalize drugs. They did all those things before. 
but at least without the added incentive of money, there would be fewer pressure groups that would prevent change. Not all big corporations use slave labor, of course. Some of them just pollute. In the 21st century, we know all about lung cancer and climate change, but actually the biggest polluters have known about those things for decades, long before they admitted it to the public. The electric car was held back by regulations because oil companies lobbied for them. Burning leaded gasoline was always known to cause health problems, but, but that news was covered up from day one because if it got out, a corporation would have lost money. There are identifiable people and institutions who have poisoned us to line their own pockets. How many deaths have they been responsible for? That's violence, and most people have no legal way to fight back. The global nature of capitalism means one person can profit off another's poverty anywhere in the world. It depends how people make their money. They might get people to work for them, or, or they might just own land and get people to pay them for it. We call those people landlords. Instead of owning land together and sharing what comes from it, a few people own the land and we have to pay them to live on or use it. If we don't pay them, we lose our homes. If we can't pay for another home, we aren't allowed a home. There might be vacant homes somewhere, but we're not allowed in them because of the law. Evictions are violence. Homelessness requires violence every day. Making shelter inaccessible, keeping food behind locked doors, forcing people out of public places because we don't want to see them. We want them out of the way so we don't have to acknowledge the effects of the system. Some people get rich by owning intellectual property. They, or more often someone working for them, invented something. And because the law protects their inventions, they gain exclusive access to that thing. So they can sell it. Not such a big deal if you're an inventor working out of your garage, which is of course why even the biggest corporations pretend that's how they started. What most people don't understand about intellectual property is the implications of exclusive ownership of things like medicine. If that's you, read up about structural violence. Here's how it works. Corporate Corp designs a pill that solves a health problem. The resources exist to give the pill to everyone who needs it. But since they have a patent, they can charge any price they want for it. If you don't have the money, you're not allowed the pill. You're not even allowed to produce a generic pill made by the same formula in a different country. So you continue to suffer. And of course, you have no recourse because it's all legal. If you die from this preventable illness, why would corporate corp care? You must not have had enough money to be one of their customers. If this doesn't sound familiar, you might not be acquainted with any poor person who needs insulin. Insulin used to be free, but at some point drug companies got hold of it, and since then its price has risen so much, now many people have to choose between buying insulin and buying food. Sounds like violence to me. Structural violence is therefore an indirect violence, but no less real because of it. Another example of it is borders. Want to go somewhere to make your life better? Maybe to survive? Oh, sorry, you're not allowed. This entire part of the planet has been walled off to you. Oh, you have money? Oh, why didn't you say so? Turns out we have space for you in our enormous landmass after all. People are standing with guns and dogs to shoot you if you cross an invisible line in the dirt. Deportations terrorize poor people and break up their families. Why is it we can so easily turn a blind eye to this kind of violence? Because, like all the other kinds I've mentioned, 
It's all legal. And that's the only excuse people need to support it. Hey, they should have just followed the law. Well, the law is violence. So what's your point? You like state violence? Or just it's okay to use violence on anyone because they didn't fill out all the forms and pay all the fees. And your attitude matters. Your attitude influences the people around you. If you tolerate bullying or racism or abuse or trans misogyny among your friends, it's going to spread. If you make excuses for borders or bosses or bureaucrats, you're justifying their power over people. Whereas if you speak out against it, you encourage others to speak out too, especially people who trust your judgment. Labor markets are also the product of violence. Wage labor was created through laws forcing people out of self-sufficiency and into factories to do mind-numbing manual work for a salary. When those people went on strike, police and strike breakers were called in to beat, arrest, and kill them. White supremacy is an integral part of how the labor market works in North America and Europe. And white supremacy has the same history denying people the legal right to resist, and terrorizing them when they do. Your taxes support a white supremacist legal system that kills people and denies them their freedom. Your taxes go towards wars, too. In the U.S., about half your federal taxes go toward a military that regularly bombs and tortures people around the world. You might not hear about it so much on the news anymore, but it's happening. The same military imposes trade sanctions, which are estimated to have killed about half a million children in Iraq in the 1990s and might have the same effect on Iran. In Canada, some of what you pay in taxes goes to debt for the war on Afghanistan, and some of it goes to arms sales to Saudi Arabia, which has used those arms to so devastate Yemen that millions of Yemenis are in need of immediate aid. The governments of both the U.S. and Canada prop up authoritarian states that regularly jail and kill people for dissent. That blood is on the hands of taxpayers, not just rulers. But we can't stop paying taxes if we can't stop working and consuming. So I don't blame everybody. We contribute to the strength of the system and the power of the ruling class because it's almost impossible not to. The system isn't invincible, but it takes a lot of work to dismantle. And trying to do so is extremely dangerous because anything we can do to resist this system is illegal. We shouldn't be paying taxes that go toward war, police, and prisons, but if we don't, we get punished. We can't avoid paying income tax without either a team of accountants or no job. And if we don't have jobs, we're not allowed to survive. We can't avoid paying sales tax without reducing our purchases to zero, which is theoretically possible, but extremely difficult to do in practice. You might think the obvious solution, therefore, is to live off the grid. But people who live off the grid often get forced back into the system's ambit, too. So we're forced to pay for our own oppression. What if you went on strike? Striking used to be illegal, and still is in many places, but activists fought for it and made it inevitable, so strikes were eventually legalized in North America, with some provisions. So you can strike, but the law says you have to give notice you're going on strike. And you're not allowed to block roads, and you're not allowed to stop scabs. But you can have a nice quiet strike over there where nobody can see you. Plus, strikes are risky because you might run out of money before your demands are met. And if they really want to, the police will light a fire and say you did it in order to break up your assembly. What if you protested in the streets? Well, the law says you have to apply for a permit to protest. And if you don't have a permit, you could get arrested. And as we know from last year, illegal protests face tear gas, rubber bullets, prisons, 
unmarked vans, and, well, whatever the police want to maintain the state's idea of order. Let's try something else. What if you wanted to stop the sale of arms to Saudi? How would you do it? You could write letters, but why would they care about your letters? You think politicians don't know the effects of their policies? Do you think a carefully worded letter will change their minds? Even thousands of letters. Where's the point where they say, Oh, now I understand I shouldn't trade people's lives for money. If they cared about that, they wouldn't be in politics. But what if we found out when and where they were meeting and disrupted their meeting? Well, that would be illegal. And unless there were thousands of us, we might all get beaten up and thrown in jail. Besides, they could just have the meeting somewhere else at a different time. If we had cells of people working all over the world, we might be able to attack them everywhere. But until that day, the ruling class will continue to make its decisions behind closed doors and continue to call it democracy. What if someone in your neighborhood was getting evicted or arrested? What if you stood between them and the police and tried to stop the violence? You might get arrested yourself. Or you might prevent someone from going to jail, losing their home, or getting deported. What if you knew a factory was going to pollute your local river? What would you do about it? Would you write more letters, maybe to local politicians or the business owners? In other words, you would appeal to their ethics and integrity and consciences? You think that's a winning strategy? There are no consequences if they refuse. And of course they will refuse because they're acting in their own perceived interest. I think there should be consequences for their using violence. What if, for example, instead of writing letters hopefully, you went to the homes of the executives who are making this decision? What if you forcibly prevented them from going to work? What if you threatened to come back at night if they took the decision to poison your water supply? That might be more effective. But of course, threatening someone with violence or preventing them from going somewhere is illegal for civilians. Where you live, what you eat, what you buy, where your taxes go. In this video, I'm addressing the bare minimum of the violence we are indirectly responsible for. Our so-called civilization is built on and maintained by violence. It uses violence against us every day of our lives. We're just inured to the system, trained by school not to see it for what it is. But it's everywhere. If you really believe in non-violence, you should be most opposed to the capitalist, colonialist, white supremacist patriarchy. And if you are, you should realize sometimes force is necessary to confront it. Thank you.